After the holiday, the soybean and corn limits going down and yet different and going up uh, energy prices. The one who is going, in, who is going to comment that is Mike Zuzlo, president of Global Commodity Analytics, right here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So, Mike, how are you today? Uh, what happened after the Independence Day holiday? Uh, we are seeing uh, corn and soybean prices going down by two, two digits. Yeah, and, you know, this comes at a time when the crop here in the United States and Canada is essentially being made or not being made. So, the conventional wisdom right now at this stage, before we know what the crop conditions for the week are uh, on Tuesday afternoon, USDA hasn't come out with those yet, and that the trade is expecting some slight improvement in corn and soybean conditions. Luis, uh, the conventional wisdom with that knowledge and not knowing exactly what the crop is going to be looking like this week uh, is that the weather models shifted the actual weather pattern brought in rains into the driest areas of the northern corn belt and the western corn belt and that came in earlier than expected based upon what we were looking at before the july 4th holiday and i think that that obviously has something to do with the limit down moves in corn and at times a limit down move in soybeans with them reaching the dollar limit in some of the contracts but coming off of that a little bit by the close on, on uh, Tuesday. However, the spring wheat and the soybean oil were two of the hardest hit commodities. And I really question whether that makes sense that it was about the Northern Plains weather, uh, given the fact that from what I am hearing, canola and spring wheat especially are past being helped. In fact, I had spoken to one person last week, late in the week, who had said that they were actually hoping they didn't get any rains because they didn't even want to have to go out and harvest. And so they were hoping that the insurance adjusters, it would stay dry and the insurance adjusters would just write off the crops as a complete total loss and they wouldn't even have to waste their time trying to harvest it. But if they got rain, they were worried that that would be something that the adjusters would want them to do. So I guess I do think that part of the drive down was uh, the weather. If it is all weather, then I think the trade is already pricing in. They shift in the pattern and that the ridge is breaking up and that we will get rain after rain after rain the rest of this week. And if that's correct, then the downside may be limited after this week, uh, after the rest of this week uh, by pricing so much in in one day. I'm dubious about that. By You can probably tell by my tone. Um, I think it's probably more related to program trading, um, maybe program trading based upon the calendar and the fact that we're past July 4th, and a lot of times the excitement in the market is hard to regenerate after July 4th. Um, part of it could be we don't know if there are some losses in demand. In other words, I'll be watching this week to see if the uh, USDA or someone reports China canceling cargoes on us, um, just because of the way this price action came pretty much out of nowhere, in my opinion, um, as far as the, the limit moved down. Um, the last thing I will say is when the crop conditions come out, if they don't come out with an improvement, I'll be eager to see how the market reacts to that because that'll give us an idea, I think, of how much of, to, of Tuesday's break to the downside was really weather related. Yes, I saw some photos uh, of the typical dry states like Colorado with a lot of, of rain over the weekend. Yeah, and this is where it could be the weather and it could be the fact that we're breaking down the ridge of high pressure at precisely the time we need it because we here in northeastern Kansas are starting to shoot tassels and we'll be in our reproductive phase in corn. A lot of my clients across the Corn Belt here in the United States are also in that uh, ready to shoot tassels and start reproduction in the next five to seven days. But I will also say that I had 
three clients from Illinois call me and one client from Indiana call me and another client or two from Nebraska call me and tell me today while the market was breaking so hard to the downside that their crop was actually getting worse. One reason because of too much rain in parts of Illinois where they've lost crops because they're underwater, especially soybeans. Uh, the other one uh, was talking about in Indiana about how their crops look very, very good right now, but they really need a good rain, especially as they go into pollination, because we've turned a lot hotter here in the major part of the Corn Belt uh, here in the United States, both the Western and the Eastern Corn Belt. So I, I guess that kind of gives you an idea of what we're seeing in the boots on the ground is the crop's not getting better, except where it was almost ready to be written off, like in parts of Colorado and maybe in parts of South Dakota and along the Iowa Minnesota border. And at the same time, uh, you have the jobs report that reported over 800,000 uh, jobs. And perhaps that uh, came along with uh, a higher crude oil price uh, in the United States, the best one since 2014. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, is a scenario that will help prices? Yeah, I think it's inflationary. And I'll throw a couple more things in there. We had a trade deficit number that came out last week and it, our exports continued to decline compared to our imports, which suggests that our buying power is too high. And that means the dollar is too high. Um, it, it looks as though to me, based upon that and the fact that OPEC could not reach a deal because of the UAE, um, that we have probably locked in high energy prices through the rest of our summer. And that inflation is not going to go anywhere anytime fast. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal. I haven't read it completely yet, but it hit the paper today talking about how grocery stores around the United States were hoarding food. They were hoarding sugar, hoarding meat, putting added uh, meat into cold storage and freezers uh, in anticipation of higher prices. We saw several companies last week Uh, in the grain sector and in the food sector, raise their prices to retailers and to consumers as well. So I don't think inflation is going to go anywhere soon. And I think that would suggest that the commodity prices should stay elevated and that investor interest should remain strong. And that's why I kind of narrowed down the possible implications of the limit down move in corn on Tuesday to maybe it being revolving around China. Um, and I had just done a weekly commentary and weekly newsletter update with a special report about of the three factors, China, inflation, currencies, and, and the like, what would be the, the in interest rates, what would be the biggest issues that would hit us potentially in the commodity markets and the equity markets, and why don't I believe in a commodity super cycle right now? And the latest Uh, rhetoric from China and the United States and Europe and some of the moves that have been made against technology companies and uh, some of the things that happened over the weekend when China celebrated their 100th anniversary of the Communist Party founding and the, uh, the speech that President Xi gave uh, leads me to believe that maybe China is more an important factor right now than maybe the market is understanding. So I'll be, again, watch, watching to see if they didn't maybe cancel something or Something's going on where it affects our commodity demand as opposed to the commodity supply, especially in light of Agrao's updated number for Brazil corn being down at 85 million tons. Yes, uh, OPEP uh, has announced that they will rise production of uh, crude oil in the coming months. Do you think that uh, is in anticipation of uh, more demand or they are increasing the supply due to the current demand? No, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, they, they pretty much went on record thinking that the second half of 2021 would be stronger demand for energies and fossil fuels uh, more than they thought prior in the springtime. Um, with the COVID outbreaks and, and some of the increases in the uh, lockdowns, that may be a stretch. So, but I think it would be a combination of seeing very strong demand, even though prices are elevated uh, at the retail level, um, because we are coming out of COVID faster than a lot of people thought in most of the big countries and most of the big emerging market countries as well. Yes, and with that uh, reduction in output in Brazil, also confirmed by Stonex, Uh, is, uh, do you agree that, uh, that there will be a strong corn upside? 
Well, I, I, I think it goes back to the demand side. And I think it goes back to, we know we're probably rationing demand. Uh, one of the things that I did in my special report last for the week, uh, this past week that I released to clients and subscribers, Louise, was I looked at 2007, 2008, and 2011, 2012, two years that I think, and we've talked about this, that are pretty similar or have some similarities to this current marketing year. And the idea was how much did we lose in terms of corn and soybean demand when prices rallied sharply? And from 2007, 2008, uh, we lost about 24% in exports between those two marketing years. And in 2011, 2012 was actually over 50%. So corn exports really took a big hit when prices rallied sharply. Soybeans, not so much. Uh, and that makes sense because China's production, domestic production of soybeans can't really get any bigger than it already is. And so it's going to have to rely upon more increasing imports as it rebuilds its hog herd and feeds its increasing middle class. And so the, the crush number was the one that got hit more than anything in those two crop years when it came to the soy. But as far as exports go, corn exports got hit hardest. That would make sense given the Brazilian production, the U.S. production of soybeans uh, feeding essentially China. Um, and also, I think it goes back to the corn has those substitutes out there like Milo, like wheat, and, and that's a good substitute to be able to have, whereas the soy doesn't have as many substitutes. So I think the downside really is based upon the demand, not the supply. Um, the upside, I think, is based on the supply. And the reason I say that is because USDA is at a 179.5 uh, yield for the United States nationally. The seven-year average is just over 172 bushels per acre. For the soybeans, they're at 50.8, and the national average is 49.3 uh, on the seven-year basis. So uh, it, it's going to be tough to make some of these yield estimates for the USDA unless we do get rains. And uh, how are you seeing uh, wheat uh, as far as the harvest and uh, the mar and market-wise? Yeah, I talked to some clients today about that in anticipation of us talking. Uh, the soft red wheat crop in Illinois and Indiana is as good as we thought it would be. Uh, 85 to 100 bushel yields with good protein is being seen pretty commonly. Uh, however, the hard red wheat is not being uh, as, as seen as good as what they were expecting for the most part. Recent rains have diminished some of the quality. Uh, and, and yields are really topping out in like averages. You'll get a field that's 75, 85, but then you'll get a field that's 45, 50. So to get over 60 or 65 bushels on yields um, is pretty difficult uh, based upon what I've seen so far. And I'd say that's a little bit disappointing uh, in some of the areas that we're expecting record or near record yields. So uh, the quality issue does bother me a little bit because that may, if we don't have enough to blend of old crop wheat, we may have to see that move into the feed channel. So I have to be watching that pretty closely. And do you think there will be more demand for sorghum at this time? Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. Especially if we don't get rains in the uh, middle part of the country, in the cattle country, and where the hay and the forage and the alfalfa and the uh, primary feed grains, you know, if, if we continue with this drought where the drought currently is, like you were talking about Colorado, very large grazing area in that part of the country. And so if they can't get a hay or alfalfa or some type of fodder or those prices go up, then the feed grains are going to have to be a, a substitute, even though they may be just as expensive. It's whatever's available in that location. And I do think there's a lot of milo and sorghum that was planted that will come off fairly early this year. So yeah, I think the, the as far as cash prices, I think sorghum and milo may be some of the best prices that we'll see uh, as far as holding in there through the harvest time period. And how are you seeing the, this ratio uh, for corn? Yeah, this is one of the things where it is a bit surprising to me, looking at the global supply demand fundamentals that the corn is losing to the soybeans. And it's pretty much been doing that ever since the acreage and stocks report. However, I will say, Luis, that I see a lot of short beans around this area. And I'm hearing a lot of clients in all parts of the U.S. bean belt west and east telling me they've got a lot of short beans. I talked to a client uh, in the heart of the best area of Illinois uh, this afternoon and he told me that his beans he planted early which have been doing so well uh, in years past as far as uh, yield, yield uh, potential and 
uh, yield determination, they actually are some of the worst this year. And so I think this early spring planting did not go well, did not go as expected. And so in that respect, I think the loss of yield in soybeans is maybe a little bit higher than the loss of yield potential in corn. And a half a bushel yield loss in national bean average here in the United States to go down to say 50.3 bushels per acre, that would take you back below a 100 million bushel carryover in this country if you did not take down demand. All right, I think that was it. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Luis. Have a great week.